Hello everybody. In this video I'm gonna demonstrate how to do a multiple linear regression and hierarchical regression in SPSS. The data that I'm gonna use for this demonstration is partially adopted from a study called uh, CORE which is spearheaded by uh, Dr. Melvin Chan of the National Institute of Education of Nanning Technological University in Singapore. The data that I'm, I'm using consists of these three variables. I also in include gender and stream, but I'm not going to use it in, the, in this analysis. It's just for demonstration here. The dependent variables, the dependent variable in this analysis is, is comprehension. And I want to see if I use grammar and vocabulary as two independent variables in the analysis, uh, whether I can predict the comprehension scores of students who participated in the study, and if so, with what level of uh, accuracy. <clears throat> so in order to run a regression analysis, we need to remember the assumptions of multiple linear regression. It's multiple since we have two or more independent variables in the analysis. If we only have one independent variable, then the analysis would be referred to as just linear regression. So that's already the second assumption of multiple linear regression, which, uh, which mentions that there should be two or more independent variables. These independent variables could, could be either continuous, like the two vocabulary and grammar score variables that I have, or categorical like gender or stream of students which I just meant I just showed you before there should also be one dependent variable therefore regression analysis can also run uh, with one dependent variable other assumptions include linearity relationships between the DV and IV lack of multicollinearity no lack of any inf uh, influential outliers and the normality of the residuals so I'm going to walk you step by step through the analysis and show you how these assumptions can be met and how to make sense of the data. Under the analyzed data in SPSS, we need to go to uh, regression analysis and linear. In this box, we need to move our dependent variable, which is comprehension, to this slot and move grammar to independent slot as well as gram as, as well as vocabulary uh, for the first analysis i'm going to do i'm not going to use next because next is used only in hi hierarchical or sequential regression now let's go, go through these tabs to figure out what we can do with them and what uh, options are there for us under the statistics tab we already see that estimates have been selected for us so we just leave it as is we choose uh, confidence intervals we check off r squared changes descriptives part and partial correlations and multicollinearity or collinearity statistics which is uh, one way to diagnose whether your data is uh, affected by multicollinearity now in some uh, sources you may read that the the Durbin Watson test of residuals is also necessary for a linear multiple linear regression as I have written here but I've crossed out the point is that the Durbin Watson uh, test is not uh, suitable for multiple linear regressions which are not based on time series and since my data is not using a time series so I'm not going to choose Durbin Watson. Continue. Under plots, uh, we need to uh, test the assumption of the uh, distribution of our residuals. In order to do so, we need to plot standardized residuals against uh, standardized predicted values. Standardized residuals are these Z resid stands for residuals you can move this to either y or x axis doesn't really matter let's just move it to y and z predict stands for 
standardized predicted values. So I'm going to move it to X and this will be just pretty enough. I would like to also get this histogram and normal prob prob probability plots. So this will allow me to investigate the normality assumptions which were mentioned before. Under save I would like to check uh, standardized residuals because this is one of the assumptions of regression and also in order to check whether we have huge outliers I would need to check off Cook's distance. Uh, Cook's distance is a statistic that is estimated by using leverage measures as well as residual values. Leverage measures are an attribute of outliers. Okay so I'm gonna click on continue. Under options uh, we don't want to change anything really here and the rest can also remain unchanged. Now we have quite several methods of regression analysis. Enter is the first one on top. It's a procedure for variable selection in which all variables in a block are entered in a single step. Stepwise is another way of doing the regression analysis. Um, at each step during stepwise analysis the independent variable uh, not in the equation uh, that has the smallest probability is entered if that probability is small, is sufficiently small, that's smaller than 0 0.05. Now variables already in the regression equation are removed if their probability of f, that's the p-value, becomes sufficiently large. That's if the p-value is uh, larger than 0 0.5. So they are automatically removed. Uh, so this method terminates the analysis when no more variables are eligible for inclusion or removal in the analysis. The next one is remove, which is a procedure for variable selection in which all variables in a block are removed in a single step. And the backward elimination is a bit more complex in the sense that uh, in this procedure all variables are entered into the equation and then sequentially are removed one at a time. The variable with the smallest partial correlation with the dependent variable is considered uh, first for removal but then if uh, it meets the criterion for elimination then it will be removed. After the first variable is removed the variable remaining uh, in the equation with the smallest partial correlation are then considered next and this will continue till only significant variables are left. And finally forward selection is a stepwise sort of procedure um, in which uh, the first variable considered for entry into the equation is the one with the largest positive or negative correlation with the uh, dependent variable. So this variable is first entered into the equation only if it satisfies the criterion for entry. If the first variable is, in, is entered, the independent variable not uh, in the equation uh, that has the largest partial correlation is then considered next. The procedure uh, then stops when there is no variable that meets the entry criterion. So this is just really a brief explanation of how these different types of uh, analyses work. But for, for the current analysis I'm going to choose enter because that's the most straightforward one. And I'm going to click OK to get the results. And here are the results. So let's go through the assumptions again. Uh, I'm going to start from the linear relationship between DV and IVs because we have already met the first two assumptions and see if we've got the linear relationships between the DV and IV. We, we need to look at the correlation uh, box here. In this matrix you see that the correlation between the comprehension score and the grammar and vocabulary score is pretty fine. It's medium. It's neither too high nor too low. 0.49, uh, 0.555. It's pretty good. So the first assumption sh seems to be fine. We meet that. And the, for the lack of collinear multicollinearity, 
what we can do is to continue looking at the correlation and also go to the tolerance and uh, uh, VIF factor, so it has to be VIF, the VIF uh, factor, that's variance inflation factor, um, in order to find out whether we have multicollinearity or not. So in this case, for for the first way of looking at multicollinearity, we'll see that the correlation between grammar score and vocabulary here, grammar and vocabulary, vocabulary is smaller than 0 0.7. This provides us some sort of strong evidence that the data is not affected by multicollinearity. Now another way of looking at this is to just quickly scroll down and go to the coefficients box. In the coefficients box you can see the collinearity statistics. We've got two types of them, tolerance and VIF, as mentioned before. The lowest score of VIF would be 1, so that's what we expect to get. But So if we get a 1 under VIF, then uh, there is no multicollinearity whatsoever. If the statistic falls between 1 and 5, well, it's an indication that we have moderate multicollinearity. And if it's larger than 5, we have high degrees of multicollinearity. So this is pretty tolerated. Uh, and so this also shows uh, that there is no multicollinearity in our data. Now, the tolerance statistics uh, is uh, 0.724, which indicates that uh, there is no multicollinearity again. So this is the third piece of evidence. And how do we know that? Well, the tolerance statistics should be uh, larger than 0 0.4, so that uh, so that would indicate that there is no multicollinearity in the data. As you see, uh, 0 0.724 is well above 0 0.4. Therefore, these three pieces of evidence, VIF, tolerance, and the correlation analysis, provide strong evidence that there is no multicollinearity, and therefore this, the assumption of multicollinearity is, um, lack of multicollinearity is uh, met. Now, influential outliers and residuals. For influ influential outliers, we need to look at the Cook's distance, as I mentioned before. Cook's distance has already been created for us in the data sheet. And this is under COO hyphen one or underline one. Uh, what we need to do is to right click on this column and sort everything in a in an ascending fashion. Uh, in a maybe descending would be better. Yeah, descending. So the rule of thumb is that if any Cook's distance statistic is larger than one, then that variable is a huge outlier and should be eliminated from the analysis. As you see, these statistics are all, well, smaller than 1. Therefore, we don't have huge outliers, luckily. Now, for residuals, we can either look at this, this column. I think this is what I would usually do. Uh, just right-click and sort everything in a descending fashion first. And if anything falls outside of 2 or 3, I mean, we have, as, as you see here, we have two criteria. If anything falls between a minus minus uh, outside of minus three and plus three, it can be eliminated. A more stringent and perhaps more acceptable criterion is minus two plus two, and this is what we see. So if anything is larger than minus two plus two, all right, these these data, they should be removed or eliminated. So you can clear this. I'm not going to do this in this analysis. Just want to show you how that can be done. And then you should rerun the analysis once more. Okay, so um, I'm going to right click on this and this time around I'm going to sort it in ascend, this uh, ascending fashion so that I'll get uh, big residuals on the negative side. And you see quite a few of these residuals are falling outside of minus 2 plus 2 and these are smaller than minus 2 and they can be eliminated too. So. I would suggest that you can eliminate these and rerun the analysis once more. Actually, my dataset is large, really, and you know, deleting this amount of data will not affect it that much. But if you have a smaller dataset, 
this might not be very a very wise procedure to do it so you might want to st uh, stick with a minus three plus three which is a more liberal range of residuals another way of investigating residuals is to look at the uh, pp plots and the qq plots uh, the PP plot here is actually a probability, probability plot, plot of regression standardized residuals. The diagonal in this plot represents normal distribution, and these dots, uh, the dots are pretty, you know, densely scattered, so you cannot see uh, visible dots here. But you know, the thick area here along the line is uh, made of dots. So the rule of thumb is that if they deviate significantly from the uh, linear line, then you have some, uh, you know, deviation from normality. This can also be identified in this scatter plot. I mean, earlier I called it QQ plot. It's actually a, a scatter plot, and the point is that the, these dots should fall between minus and plus three on both horizontal and vertical lines. So they seem to be falling between minus and plus three, here and here, and here and here. So it seems fine to me. But finally, it, it would be a good idea to also look at the residual statistics uh, table there, because that's helpful. For residual statistics, we should look at the standards residuals and their range. As you see, I've already seen this in the variable that uh, was created earlier here. I've already seen that uh, the range minimum maximum falls within minus three plus three, but it's uh, larger than minus two plus two, and therefore, if uh, you want to go by that criterion, you can adjust your variables by destroying those that do not follow minus two plus two criterion. Okay, now that everything seems to be relatively fine, we need to look at the results of our regression analysis. The first thing we need to look at is what we call the f goodness of fit. And it's measured through R squared value. And the R squared value refers to the amount of variance that is explained by our independent variables, which are grammar score and vocabulary score. So 36.2% uh, of the variance is explained by our uh, two dependent var independent variables. We also have adjusted R square values in large samples, uh, which um, basically represent the population better. The R adjusted R square values and R square values are more or less the same as you see the case here. So it doesn't really matter which one you'll uh, report. So this side of the table will be more meaningful in a hierarchical or sequential regression analysis. So we can just stick with this side. 36.2% uh, of the variance is explained by the two independent variables. Now we need to know if both independent variables have a significant impact on the dependent variable. This is the table that we need to look at. Uh, we need to look at the uh, standardized coefficients, beta. Um, so beta basically uh, quantifies the influence or the magnitude of of influence of independent variables on the dependent variable uh, standardized coefficient beta of uh, 0.411 indicates if grammar score increases by one standard deviation the dependent variable or comprehension score would increase by 0 0.411 standard deviations uh, of course, um, under the circumstances where, where the vocabulary score is held constant. In the same way, if we if we hold grammar the, the effect of grammar score constant, that's if we partial out its, its effect. Uh, if the vocabulary score goes up by one standard deviation, the comprehension score will increase by 0.2 seven four standard deviations and these two increases are both statistically significant as you see in the p-value here so the two variables have been able to predict uh, about 36.2 uh, percent per, 
percent of the uh, variance and that's to, to explain it's 32 um, 36.2 percent of the variance in comprehension score and they have these impacts these quantified impacts on comprehension score now one last thing is the ANOVA test here it basically simply tells us if there is a significant if the slope of the regression line is significantly different from zero we don't want the regression line to have a slope of zero and as a result we would like to see a significant p-value here which means that the slope of reg the regression line is significantly different from zero so there is some slope there and as a result our regression model is able to predict the dependent variable uh, using the independent variables in the analysis. Now I would like to quickly go back to the linear regression analysis and this time round uh, move these variables one at a time to the independent box. So the first variable that I want to enter into the analysis is vocabulary. Then I, I'm going to click next so I will create a uh, hierarchical regression. This time round I want to enter grammar so these two will be just pretty fine. I'm not going to change anything else really in this analysis and I'm going to click OK. So we will, we're will we going to have two models in the analysis as you will see and we can compare those two models to see which one of them fits better and choose that. I've already talked about the correlation and the correlation of the statistics. They remain the same so the variables that entered into the analysis are both vocabulary and grammar and this is the model summary like I said we have two models uh, so model one has a, a an R square value of 0 0.24 the second one which is just pretty much like uh, the previous model which we estimated uh, has a an R square value of 0.362 so the second model seems to be a better one just based on the R square value. This is more meaningful now because the R square changes if we move from model 1 to 2 and this change has an, an F statistic associated with it which is pretty large this uh, 330.413 and with an R square change of uh, 0.122 which is statistically significant. Therefore, model one has a statistically significantly better R square value than this than the first model. Uh, model two has sorry, model two has a statistically significantly better fit than the sec uh, than the first one, according to this p value here. The ANOVA, which as I mentioned, is an indication of whether the slope is significantly different from zero. Uh, is also statistically significant in both which is good news for both models ultimately we need to choose one of these two models so well, let's look at the I, VIF and tolerance statistics uh, these are not really too bad although if you have only one predictive variable uh, the VIF and tolerance would be better but these are not too bad they're still acceptable what matters here is that uh, we look at the standardized coefficients as you see together these two predict more of the variance if we add them up uh, they predict more of the variance than if we just include the variable and both of them are statistically significant because uh, the regression coefficient the standardized regression coefficient is 0.274 for vocabulary and for grammar is 0.411 Whereas for the vocabulary score in the first model, in which we only have one predictor, uh, the standardized coefficient is 0.490. Overall, I would prefer the second model because it's also theoretically more justifiable to include both vocabulary and grammar score, not to mention that its R-square value, that's the fit, uh, goodness of fit, was much better than the R square value of the first model. So the rest of the analysis, the output is more or less the same as what I talked about earlier. So this brings me to the end of the discussion of uh, regression analysis, both multiple linear regression and hierarchical linear regression. Now one last thing uh, before I close this uh, presentation is 
so far we only have had this part of the equation in which grammar uh, can predict comprehension as well as vocabulary now the question is what if we throw in the for example another another variable like writing score and we want to examine a more complicated relationship in which grammar and vocabulary predict comprehension and comprehension itself can predict writing and writing is also predicted by grammar and vocabulary meaning that grammar and vocabulary can have uh, a direct influence on comprehension and a direct influence on writing and also an indirect influence on writing through comprehension this is not a question that can be addressed by grammar this will be done by path analysis or structural equation modeling which is a topic of a video that I'm going to uh, create very soon. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Stay tuned in and uh, um, I will soon uh, make sure to create that video and upload it. Have a good day.